Well, the Dallas Cowboys got back on track, finally, finally earning themselves another win. They improved to 7-7 seven and seven on the year after they decimate the Los Angeles Rams at AT&T Stadium this past Sunday. Now, I'll be honest with you, I was at the point where I didn't know if this team would win another game this year after the Chicago disaster. And it it kind of had that feeling, but you know what? Say what you will about Garrett, and trust me, what I'm saying about Garrett is I still want him gone. But say what you will about Jason Garrett, his team always inexplicably finds a way not what I was going for, but we'll roll with it. His team always finds a way to answer the bell in in big moments when his pretty much neck is on the line. That's pretty much what happened here. Now, the parameters, the guidelines have not changed for him. He still is a NFC Championship game appearance or bust. That hasn't changed. And just because the team responded one week for him doesn't mean much. Now, I know the Rams came into this game at 8-5 and five and had some good momentum behind them. They, their defense had been playing pretty damn well the past couple weeks. But it's still a situation where Dallas had not played up to snuff. Now, in this game, they finally showed up. You get a rare turnover from the defense, that coming in the form of a Sean Lee interception, his first interception since 2017. Uh, That was right before the half that allowed Dallas to take a commanding control of the game. But the game was still a little bit of a slow start for the offense. You have, of course, the disaster at the very start with the coin flip and all the confusion in which it looked like the Cowboys gave up a free, not a free possession, but gave up. uh, They didn't get the on or the original kick of the game. And what they wanted was to defer. But there was confusion to the point where the ref determined that, oh, no, I'm pretty sure Dak also said they don't want the ball to start the second half either. Therefore, the Rams get an extra possession. Like, no, no, that is not what we said. And thankfully, the NFL stepped in, the New York office stepped in at halftime, corrected that, so Dallas did start the second half with the ball, and just continued to throttle the Rams behind that. Now, in the game, uh, Dak gets off to a little bit of a slow start. You know, he's dealing with a couple injuries to his hands and wrists, and that's something to still keep an eye on. He's playing through a hairline fracture in his right index finger, I believe, which is... That's not nothing, man. That That's pretty tough when you got on your throwing hand a hairline fracture and a finger. Now, it's not the last finger to come off the ball in a pass, but it's right there with it. So uh, that's problematic for him. And Dallas answered that bell by saying, okay, we have to lean on the on the running game. Zeke has been running the ball much better in recent weeks. We just haven't kept ourselves in position to continue utilizing that and taking advantage of that throughout these games. So we're going to do that in this game. And that's what they did. They fed Zeke and Zeke churned up yards. Uh, Big plays from Elliott in this regard. He had, you know, I don't even have it written on, on the board here, but Zeke 24 carries for 117 yards, two touchdowns. He also had another three catches for 43 yards in the game as well. So Zeke, yeah, Zeke was doing work when you're getting 4.9 on the ground and another 14.3 through the air in terms of your average you're dominating this game. This is this was vintage Zeke. This is a Zeke we have not seen much of, I would say, in the last two years. Not this year or last year. You haven't seen a lot of him. You saw this guy a lot in his rookie year and in his sophomore season, and he hasn't really been there in the last year and a half, year and change. But having him back was huge. Now, Pollard... I think Dallas was better in how they utilized him as well, rather than saying, hey, we'll take the first couple drives to get Zeke going, and then we'll change it up with Pollard. Well, in the past, what they were doing is when they couldn't get Zeke established, they were just like, well, you know, we haven't gotten Zeke going yet. Why put Pollard in there yet? And so Pollard would just kind of be left floating out there in the abyss, never getting opportunity. And so this week, they finally said, no, you know what? Two for Zeke, one Pollard. Two Zeke, one Pollard. Like, they started using him much more consistently And yeah, you see the burst, the explosion from Tony Pollard. He is tough to bring down. He breaks tackles and makes things happen. He should have been tackled for a loss on a critical third down in the second half. And what does he do? He breaks the tackle and goes for 33 yards, cutting up field. He makes like four Rams miss. I mean, the dude has talent. It is almost criminal 
that we have not utilized a fraction of his potential on the offense this year. And I know the offense in terms of total yardage is the best in the league, but good God, man, we're not converting many points. And when you see the kind of home run threat he presents, it's it's baffling that they would not take advantage of that. But they got him going here, 12 for 131. Tony Pollard gets a ridiculous 10.9 average. Now he gets a huge run there of 40-something yards. Uh, let me see. Yeah, 44 yards to cap it off with that touchdown run when Dallas, with about three minutes left, is just trying to bleed the clock. And instead, he pops it open and just like, all right, I'll, you know, I'll walk into the end zone with this. Why not? So, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty big there. The running game completely opened this up for Dallas. Now, it's a very quiet game from the combination of Michael Gallup and Amari Cooper. Part of that comes from the fact that because Dak only got 23 pass attempts, he there wasn't as much opportunity there, right? Like, Tavon Austin is your leader with one catch for 59 yards. In terms of receptions, it's Elliott with his three for 43. Jarwin had two for 40. Witten had four for 36, including a nasty one-handed back shoulder catch that he takes in for a touchdown number 72 of his career. I believe he's now tied. He's either one back of Des or tied. I forget. But he's right there for the all-time franchise record with the Cowboys. Uh, two games left. Still got a chance to get it. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, that was that was nasty. And once he got that going, I think the team popped. I think that energized the team to see old man Witt, Mr. 37-year-old out there, showing he's got some stick em on that glove. Because that was a that was a tough catch, even if you were talking about a Jarwin, a guy that's like 15 years younger than him, I would have been damn impressed by that play. But for Witten, whoo, that was nice. Uh, in that, though, you have Gallup, one for six. Cobb, one for negative three. And Cooper, one for 19. Cooper was only targeted twice, Gallup three times, Cobb twice. So the, the targets weren't there. And yeah, the Rams got some good cornerbacks, obviously. You know, we, we know about their team and what they bring to the table. You're going to have to figure out how to work with that. And it's just one of those things where anytime you're dealing with a Jalen Ramsey or uh, whatever, whatever they want to throw in that secondary at you, you're going to be a little hard pressed and... Because the running game was what was working and it was turning up yards and the tight ends were able to make some plays. Jarwin still makes big yardage plays and his two catches churns up some yardage. That o that opened things up for the team as a whole. Now Dallas goes up. They're up 14-7. And then you get Sean Lee with a quick interception before halftime. Returns it down. Dallas takes a commanding lead then at the half. And they never look back. Like they really, really don't. They stay in firm control of this game. This is a complete game for Dallas. This is a blowout. I am very pleased in all the areas for them. Now, I will say this. Kai Forbath, fantastic kicking the ball. Uh, in terms of his kickoffs, got to work on that, bro. <laughs> got to work on that. In this case, Kai Forbath, uh, let's see here. Three for three, made a long of 50, five for five on extra points, and he made two other kicks as well. I had some good context here. I saved a screenshot of it at the time. It was something crazy like, oh, here it is. This is from uh, Michael Gelkin on Twitter. Kai Forbath has made more field goals from 40 to 49 yards today in his Cowboys debut than Brett Maher made all season. Forbath was good twice from 42 and with a 50-yarder to boot. So good twice from 42 and made a 50-yarder. For context, Brett Maher was one of five between 40 and 49 yards in 13 games this year. Again, why did we still have Brett Maher on this freaking roster until just this past week? It's such a joke how how much they were like, oh, we like his big kick ability. Yeah, there's no pressure when you're kicking from that distance, dude. And when you're conceding, saying, hey, man, I'm willing to try a 60-yarder here. Let's be conservative and not try to really get a first down. That's crap. That's crap, and you're killing your team when you're doing that. So, yeah, this is a, this is a really... Good bounce back. Of course, the opening kickoff after the coin flip debacle, he kicks it out of bounds. And so the Rams start on their own 40-yard line, short field immediately. And then he does it again in the second half. Uh, short field opportunity for them again. Normally, I would say that's almost a cuttable offense. But we're just going to have to say, you know what? Let's just chalk it up to rust. I think we're your sixth team. You were with us once before in camp. Uh, we're just going to have to chalk, chalk it up to rust and say, okay, well, we can improve this, but your kicking, 
Your field goals, 50, 42, and 42, we need that. We need that in the worst kind of way. And so we're going to understand here, beggars can't be choosers, and we just need to take care of it. Also from Percy Howard on Twitter, Zeke Elliott touches on first and 10 in the first half uh, of the three previous weeks. That's the New England, Buffalo, and Chicago, the three-game losing streak, the second three-game losing streak of the year. For, uh, 42 first and 10 opportunities, 26 touches for Zeke. Against the Rams, there were 15 first and 10s and four Zeke touches. So they're making adjustments there. They're understanding that, hey, we got to get him as touches, but we don't want to overexpose. And so I think that that actually showed good awareness in that regard uh, of that, seeing what worked versus what didn't work and making adjustments accordingly. So, yeah, this is a, this is a really good position for Dallas to be sitting in because I know it sounds crazy, right? Don't be wrong. I'm not going to come out here and be like, Super Bowl contenders, they won a game. It's their first win against a team with a winning record this season. Book them in the Super Bowl. No, not saying that at all. What I am saying is our division is weak. The Eagles are also 7-7. Seven and seven. They've barely the last two weeks uh, won the, the walking wounded. Several critical injuries, and unlike their Super Bowl year, they are not rising above it right now. They barely squeak out wins the past two weeks against the Giants and Redskins, respectively. They don't look like they are... They got, like, nothing at wide receiver. They don't look like they're ready in this case for Dallas. And now Dallas goes to Philadelphia... Where, oddly to his credit, Jason Garrett has been quite good in his career. I think at Philadelphia, uh, he's something like 8-2. and two. I mean, really, really good in these situations. So that's going to be a real advantage, I think, for, for Dallas. They're healthier. I think they're the more talented team. And not to say either of them are playing great lately. They're not. But I think Dallas... When focused and when prepared mentally, I think that they can overcome it. Now, I think Philadelphia's got a better coach, but I've been saying that about literally every opponent to the Cowboys this year and for the past 10 years. So we'll see, but this is a, this is a good answer from Dallas. Season on the line, hanging in the balance. They get back to 500, put themselves in good position to close out the division this coming Sunday against the Eagles, and that's going to open things up for them. Uh, for the game here, let me see. I wanted to run through some more notes on the game. Yeah, so time of possession, Dallas wins that battle 36-23, almost 24 minutes for the Rams. That's that's vintage Cowboys game plan. Control the clock, uh, squeeze the air out of the ball, all that. Their ground game, they go over 263 yards compared to 22 for the Rams, Todd Gurley, he got a little bit of garbage time, a little bit of garbage production late, but he, he didn't do anything really in the game. Dallas kept him in check, and that was a big answer from the Dallas defensive front. Total yards, 475 to 311. Dallas wins, pa excuse me, the Rams win passing yards, 289 to 212. Again, Dallas's game plan wasn't built around that. 263 rushing yards for Dallas compared to a measly 22 for the Rams. 25 first downs for Dallas compared to 23. Four penalties for Dallas, five for the Rams. Dallas avoids a turnover, whereas the Rams commit the one pick to Lee. Dallas gets two sacks. Meanwhile, Dak has never once sacked. That's huge. And uh, total plays was pretty much even. So Dallas Dallas really held him in check. I mean, garbage time inflates the Rams' total yardage in that case. But Dallas pretty much held them completely in check. Jared Goff, 33 of 51 for 284. Two touchdowns and a pick. That's not anything amazing. It's an 84 quarterback rating. Dak is, I think, 126 for this game. Let me check here. 123.8. Um, you got Todd Gurley, 11 attempts for 20 yards. And again, he popped like a 10-yard run at the end of the game to give him this touchdown and to bring his average to that level. He So 1.8 a carry. So his long was an 8, and that was his touchdown run. Oof. So you're telling me he was 10 for 12 yards at one point. Ouch. Uh, let's see. The tight end situation for the Rams is a great Higby monster game. 12 for 111, um, long of 26, 14 targets, 12 catches. That's pretty solid production. What I thought was stupid by the Rams is when the game is clearly out of the reach in the waning minutes, they end up getting a touchdown on the possession, but you have a couple dumb plays where they're using timeouts, and it's like you're down three scores with three minutes left, dude. And you see 
Brandon Cooks, their receiver, just get laid out on a play. Dallas picks the ball, but for the second time on that drive alone, Michael Bennett lined up in the neutral zone, so it's waved off. Dallas loses that interception. I think that actually might have been on a two-point conversion now that I think about it. But regardless, um, you're just getting your guys hurt. You're putting them in danger in a game that's, one, it's not critical to them. I mean, they needed it. They do. They're in a bad situation, the Rams are, for a return to the playoffs. But at that point, it's I don't see what's worth fighting for at that point. Why are you drawing this game out to put your guys in harm's way? Because if Cooks had been injured or now he misses an even more critical game after this, you did that to him. You put him out there in that situation when it didn't make sense to do it. Cup got going late. He gets a lot of work in garbage time as well. Six catches for 41 yards and a touchdown. That was all very late, though. Uh, Robert Woods, who just murdered you and ran his mouth in the in the divisional round last year, talking about how he believes he's one of the best receivers in the league. Only four for 17 for him on nine targets. He does nothing, and that's what should have happened last time, but didn't. Uh, not a whole lot else worth bringing up here for them. You, you kept, obviously... For whatever it's worth, the Cowboys have never really allowed themselves to be destroyed by Aaron Donald. Now, he did get a tackle for loss, but three tackles, two solo. I don't think he has a sack yet against the Cowboys, despite playing him like five times now in his career. So that's that's interesting for whatever it's worth, that the probably single most dominant defensive line player in the league, for whatever reason, has never hurt or killed you. Um, even in the divisional round last year, it was more in Dominican Sue, you know, eating your lunch, so... It is what it is, man. The Cowboys get a much-needed win. They're still in the driver's seat. They still control their destiny. And I think they're going to win the NFC East. I think it's a low bar and a you know very small silver lining. But I think they're going to go back to the playoffs again. That's not to say that uh, I expect them to be great. I know Jerry is still hopeful that they can somehow put it together and go on a Super Bowl run. I don't see that happening. But at the same time, I, in fact, I think it's laughable to assume it's Super Bowl run. But at the same time, we've seen this team as unpredictable as it is. When it plays up to snuff, when it plays up to its potential, you see why so many people here put this team at an 11 and 5, some at a 12 and 4 record mark in predicted NFC Championship game. Yours truly included. But when they don't, they can be beaten by anybody, including the Jets. So. We'll see, man. That's going to that's gonna do it for my time, though. I've been DDP. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.